I have met two prophets in my life, two prophets, okay? I met Martin Luther King and I met Malcolm X. I met both of them. I didn't met, I've, I've met two prophets in my life and they're the two prophets. There would be, let's say, 12 people in a room. I think because I wore a suit and tie, they thought I was a preacher. I was, I'm obviously not a preacher, I'm a Roman Catholic, okay? Um, but so folks talked. I would see people arguing, everybody else arguing. Dr. King was just as cool and calm. I'll tell you somebody else who could remain calm in a crisis. That was Tom Bradley. That was one of Tom Bradley's uh, things. Is he seemed to be able to, me, I'm ready to fist fight, but uh, Dr. King was just as calm and everybody else would be yelling at each other and, and, and going at each other, you know. So that, that, that he, was, he was a very calm person. And he was a good brother. And it's funny because Dr. King really wasn't that much older than me. But he seemed like he was older than me. He seemed like an old man. Okay. And I never saw Dr. King when he didn't have a suit and a tie on. Never. And I saw him many times. I can't even tell you how many. Dr. King did have a presence about him, but it wasn't anything that he did. It was that you just knew he was there. He was very calm. He was just very calm. He would get in front of crowds and just excite we always we used to laugh. Stokely, we used to laugh about. We called him. Oh, we called him Doc. Okay, that was everybody called him Doc. If you said Doc, you knew who you're talking about. Uh, he said that. He said uh, they go. He said Dr. King could get us so riled up. We going down the marching down the street, and we know we getting our ass whipped when we get down there. But we we walking down the street singing, but we about to get our ass whipped. So anyway. That, I mean, he, he had charisma. I don't know how to explain it, okay? You just believed in him. You know, he just believed in him. He didn't, there was nothing that I could think of that he did. He didn't try to be the center of attention. He just was the center of attention. We were at some Hollywood celebrity's house. Um, I sat down on a couch, and the, this was the last time I saw Doc alive, as a matter of fact. He sat down next to me, and he had just done the demonstrations in Cicero, um, and I remember that, and I was telling him that the people that I saw on television that, you know, be, you know, you watch your step, because they seemed to be more hostile than even the white folks in Mississippi and Alabama, and I remember him saying, because he talked very deliberately and very slowly, and he says, Yes, there does seem to be a difference between the people there in Illinois and the people in Mississippi. I remember him saying that, you know. Um, but he also said words to the effect that, you know, you know, uncommitted life is not worth living. You know, I can't worry about what might happen to me. So I, I remember him telling me that, too. So those are, that's one memory. The other one is, and I'm never going to forget this, because uh, Dr. King was upset that he could not go to more black churches. The only black church he was coming to uh, was there. And I remember, because I talked about how much bigger Dr. Peters was than Dr. King. And I remember Dr. P Peters putting his arm around Dr. King, okay? And he said, what did, you know, how much money you need? You know, what, what were you thinking you were going to make on this trip kind of thing? And that's when he went out. And I think Dr. P King said 25,000. He said, well, we hope at least make 25,000. And he, I remember him saying that. And uh, then Dr. Peters excused himself and was gone five, ten minutes. And he came back. That's when he, gave, he had a note with what address and asked me to go to this address. And I'll always remember that. So those are two times. So I met Malcolm when I was 15, maybe, years old. He was, I think I told you a story that he was at, uh, uh, there was a newspaper called the Herald Dispatch. Their office was on Jefferson. Um, I guess Jefferson becomes an important street because that was also where the school I went to, Holy Name, existed. And um, oh, what was her name? Uh, a woman owned the newspaper. And I was so naive, I'd written some poems and I wanted to publish, I wanted the newspaper to publish my poems. And I went there and I remember meeting this tall, skinny, light-skinned man and he, who was talking fast and excuse me, he was talking shit. He was talking about how the white man is the devil and 
He's the, and you have to understand my, my mind wasn't right there at that time. And he's talking, I, you know, and I, I thought he was, I thought the brother was crazy, okay, if you really want to know the truth. Then I saw him, that was, let's say, on a Thursday or Friday or something like that. Then I was at home uh, around 6 o'clock on a Saturday, and he was on a show that uh, a guy who used to write, I think, for the Los Angeles Times, Paul Coates, um, and I had always thought of Paul Coates as being, you know, at least a liberal. Malcolm tore him a new asshole. I mean, Malcolm just degraded him, just destroyed him. And I suddenly realized uh, how brilliant Malcolm was, how articulate, how smart. I'd never seen a black man talk to a white man the way he talked to this Paul mm -hmm. Coates. I, I'd, I'd never seen that before. Us organization was founded by two people. Mm -hmm. Ron Karanga and Elaine Jamal. Elaine Jamal is Malcolm X's cousin. Hakeem. Hakeem. Elaine is what we called him. Uh, maybe he changed the name to uh, Hakeem. Just see, I knew him. I knew Karanga as Ronald Everett. So, right. I mean, I knew him as Ronald Everett. So, if I said, you know, so I'm, I'm just telling you. Uh, anyway, Elaine Jamal, okay? Um, and maybe he changed the name from Elaine to Hakeem, okay? Mm -hmm. And he moved to Boston. I know that because there was tension, so forth and so on. He was living in Compton at the time. It's a long story. Okay. We all, Karanga, Jamal, Babu, John Floyd, we all had decided that we were going to join Malcolm's organization. Malcolm was supposed to be coming out here. Malcolm got killed in February. Uh, I think 65. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had already decided that we were going to join. We were just waiting for Malcolm to come out here and we were all going to go in the same organization. Organization of African American Unity? Right. Okay. We were all going to join. We had made, you know, we were just waiting for Malcolm to come out. He went, uh, Jamal was supposed to be bringing him out and so forth. And so we're waiting for it. Um, I talked to Huey. Huey and I talked about this. Huey said he and Bobby were up in Oakland. They was talking about they were going to join up mm -hmm. in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And when Malcolm got assassinated, um, that just, I mean, and that's why you have all these other organizations because we were all going to go on that, which also brings me, as I've gotten older and seen so many things, uh, I don't want to, Somebody think I'm just a kook or something like that, but I, I wonder about all these conspiracy theories. Did folks understand that we were all, because if you know anything about Jagger Hoover, he talked about he did not want the rise of a black mm -hmm. messiah. Mm -hmm. And he, and I, I know the Central Intelligence Agency was extremely concerned about Malcolm having been in, in Africa and uh, had done the Hodge and done that, that other thing. I do know that. Um, I've always wondered about Malcolm's assassination, how um, somebody could kill Malcolm, and it would seem like it was a setup. And then as the escape car that they used was the same car that Malcolm had driven that day to the mob. I mean, to, it was a theater, to the yeah, theater. Uh, Audubon Ball. Right, mm -hmm. right. How could the folks who killed him get in the car that he came in? Stop and think about that, okay? That, so that's it. I'll tell you another piece. Michael Tiger, my professor at UCLA Law School, who also was the person I told you went to the FBI for me to see whether I could be a lawyer or not. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Tiger represented one of the folks who was charged. And Michael Tiger believed that it was a setup that the client that he represented uh, I think uh, was not guilty, had, did not do it, and was not had not participated, and he believed that strongly. But he couldn't, you know, so much. They still got convicted. But the bottom line is, Tiger himself uh, felt that uh, his client was innocent of the murder of Malcolm X. Exactly, being uh, accomplice, complicit, a part of a conspiracy.